So she doesn't mind me sharing, but she basically had said she really likes coming here. It feels like a family. And that's what church should feel like. It should feel like a family. It should be that unconditional love and acceptance, you know, no judging others, sharing the love message, the message of Jesus Christ, growing up together in grace, supporting each other, exhorting each other, strengthening each other, as iron sharpens iron. And that is a family. You know, we are part of the Holy Family. You know, our dad in heaven and our brother in heaven. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. It is a family affair, and it should be. Churches should feel like that. And I'm glad that it's one of the prayers on the prayer list is that we would have a home, a place where people can feel accepted, non-judged, come and hear, you know, the Word of God. And um, without conditions, you know, that's important that people could hear it. And if they're not saved, they can hear the truth and accept that for themselves or not, you know, and but we could still continue to be kind and nice and gracious to people. That's important as a church. It's important for me as an individual. I want to be part of a family. I think that's the, such a beautiful thing. We continue to study Colossians. In Colossians, Paul writing a letter to the people of Colossus. You know, Epaphras, uh, we know that Paul studied and uh, Paul actually lived in uh, Ephesus for three years, and probably Epaphras went to uh, was 100 miles east of uh, Ephesus there, Colossus there, and uh, he probably heard the gospel of Christ, and he brought uh, the message back to Colossus and uh, shared that. People got saved now, but you know, they, battled the, they battled some issues in, in Colossus there. The people thought they had a new knowledge of Christ, and uh, Colossians is an incredible book written for the body of believers that, uh, where we can grow in grace and understand there, that uh, Christ is, he is completely God. You know, there, uh, that we not undervalue or underestimate the power of Christ, the power of the gospel, because that is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. It actually translates you, it changes your, eternally desti- changes your eternal destiny by when you put your faith in Christ. That's the power of the gospel. So as we study uh, Coloss, uh, the book of Colossians, we're in chapter 2. Those are the verses we'll be probably turning to today. And uh, maybe, uh, but we'll be in Colossians chapter 2, we'll get through. But today's name of the verse, or today's name of the message is Walk in Christ. You know, just like we sang on page 13, that led the chorus for just a closer walk with thee. You know, just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. You know, that's what it's all about, that we would walk with him every day, that we would walk with him closer and closer. And that would be the message today. How do we do that? How do we walk closer in Christ, with Christ? Why are we left behind? Those are important questions that we would hope that we would answer today. We do not pass an offering plate here. We do not ask for money. There's an offering plate and there's a box in the back on the wall. There, no pastor, no elder takes any money here. It is all you used for to buy the building and or to purchase Bibles. We support ministries in Haiti, Kenya, the Philippines uh, are the three main places at this time. We do have uh, also in Cameroon a pastor that we're supporting. So... Those are what the money's used for. We're updating our bathrooms. We have a bathroom upstairs. For We do have bathrooms downstairs, but we want to have a functioning bathroom upstairs for the handicapped and or el- elderly that can't use the stairs. And uh, we are have bought new chairs. So these chairs are temporary. And we also have uh, a new boiler system that we're going to be putting in downstairs. So that's what the money is used for. We have a couple models that we live by. One is that we live by, we're saved by grace and we live by grace, grow in grace, like Brian said. We have a couple, uh, basically, bookmarks back there and if you're free to take one, and we have having tracks in the back, take them. I know Alicia, I did her marriage, her and Tom's, and they built some nice boxes back there, but please take as many having tracks as you want and or um, bookmarks. 
But that's really what we're about is saved by grace, live by grace. It's one of the models that we have. Hopefully we'll get that on our bookmarks in the future. And uh, our specific learning outcome today is as a child of God, I think the most important thing a child can do is read letters from home. And I talk about, you know, I heard of a song, I think his, his name was John Michael Montgomery. It was probably 20 years ago when we first, uh, after, you know, 9-11 had hit and, you know, a lot of our young men and women going off to war. He writes a song called Letters from Home. And uh, I was reading the word uh, just this weekend and it's letters from home. Like Letty said, you know, it's a family affair. And our dad has written us letters. And, uh, you know, he sent us a message from heaven. And that is exactly what these letters are. They're letters from home. And as a child of God, I think that's probably the most important thing that you could ever do is probably read the letters from home. Read the letter that God has written to you because he's got a message in there for you. And I tell you what, you want the answer to life, you want the answer of what your call is, you want the answer to the struggles you're going through, read the word. Every answer that man has ever come up with will always be answered in the word of God. And that's where it's at. That's where it's at. So hopefully through today, you'll uh, see that. And Paxton's throwing toys. <laughs> Just like your grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Brian said, love to have babies in the church. So let's look at Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to read 4 through 7. A little bit of a recap, and then we're going to get, you know, we're going to focus on more verses 6 through 7 today, and may a little bit at 8. So Colossians 2. And this I say, and again, we have Bibles in the back. Encourage you to get the Bible, follow along, read along. Yes, please get up, make yourself a Bible, but uh, please follow along. You know, it's want people to see it and read it for themselves. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I am absent in flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And as you have, therefore, received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding with thanksgiving. So last week we talked a lot about enticing and beguiling words, which are words of flattery and gossip. We know that's exactly what Satan did to Eve in Genesis chapter 3. He beguiled Eve, is what, he, what the Bible said. We discussed the importance of being steadfast in the faith. And that is, we know, steadfast in faith in Christ, is what verse 5 says. Why do we need the importance of that? Why do we need to know that? That we not be moved, like we talked about moral, therapeutic deism last week. Secular humanism, or new age, basically an alternative, alternate approach to spirituality. That we would not get caught up in that because that's exactly what verse 8 says. It says, verse 8 says that, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And that's the problem. So we need to be steadfast in the faith in Christ so we would not get caught up in the philosophy of Aristotle and Socrates and Pluto or things like that. That we would not get caught up of the rudiments of the world. That we would not get caught up, you know, following, basically learning those things first and not Christ. So that we would not be moved by man's doctrine. We would not be moved by man's philosophy. Not be moved by man's deceit. That we would not be moved by traditions of men after the rudiments of this world. That we would not be deceived of the lies of men and demons of doctrines. That we remain steadfast in the faith that's in Christ. There's only one way to heaven and it's through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the Son of God. Man is a sinner. Man deserves to go to hell. I deserve to go to hell. 
Heaven's a perfect place and man has missed the mark of perfection. That's a fact. We've all missed the mark of perfection. Every week I ask men all the time, you know, I talk to men and they're like, where are you going when you die? And all of them usually say, well, I think I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I'm a good person. Well, you know what? Heaven's a perfect place and good never makes it to heaven. You got to be perfect. So good falls short every single time. So man needs to hear that all the time. If you want to get to heaven, you got to be perfect. But you know what? My Bible says you were conceived in sin. I was conceived in sin. I'm rooted in a sin nature, my flesh. I've missed the mark of perfection at birth. So sorry, no man is perfect. Heaven's a perfect place, but man's not. But you know what? If, you, if that was the end of the story, that would be a doom and gloom message. But we know the good news is this. The good news is that God loved us, like Brian said. And he demonstrated that love. He just didn't say, I love you. But he says, you know what? In John 15, he says, a, a, you know, a, a friend that loves his friends. He laid his life down for us, is what he says. So that is the good news. God loved us and he demonstrated that love for all mankind. And he demonstrated it right there. At Calvary. At Golgotha. The gospel of Christ is God's love demonstrated. It is God's love demonstrated. Christ loved all mankind so much that he revealed himself in the flesh and he climbed the tree of death. Matter of fact, Deuteronomy 21 says it was a curse to be hung on a tree. Before crucifixion was ever, 1,500 years before it ever came to true, because the Romans invented true crucifixion, they said to be hung on a tree was a curse. And we know in Galatians 3 that Christ became a curse for all of us. He died on the tree. He climbed that tree of death so we all could be grafted into the tree of life. And ultimately I say this, if you reject the gospel of Christ, you reject his love. You reject his love. I don't want to reject his love. I want to accept his love. Rejecting the gospel of Christ is rejecting God's life, God's love. We know that Christ became sin for all mankind, that the sin of mankind was actually placed upon him. And if you turn your Bibles over to 1 Peter 2.24, it tells us this. The sin of mankind was actually placed upon him. He took our sin and he died for all of our sin at Calvary. And 1 Peter is at the end of the Bible there by 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. And 1 Peter says this, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. And in the context by whose stripes you were healed, we know that as Isaiah 53, the Bible here, the Holy Spirit revealing us that Isaiah 53 is definitely talking about Christ dying on the tree for our sins. So without Christ, without Christ, you're still dead in your sins. Without Christ, we're all hell doomed sinners. Without Christ, we're all hopeless, helpless, harmful, hurtful sinners. Jesus the Christ resurrected the third day to show us the entire world that he was a satisfied sacrifice for sin. He paid for all sin mankind. Now Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, will give you the perfection. He'll give you the perfection that's required to get to heaven and it's only received by faith in Christ. It's not walking to the front of the church, making a promise, dedicating that you're going to stop sinning, saying, you know what, I'm going to make my life more like Christ and I'm going to do this, I'm going to join a church, I'm going to give a bunch of money, I'm going to go get water baptized, I'm going to go to confirmation, I'm going to go to communion, I'm going to take confessional, things like that. None of that saves you. It's not doing any of that. Just like the thief on the cross, the thief on the cross, he changed his mind right then and there and he accepted Christ Jesus as a Savior and Jesus says, today... That will be with me in paradise. So the question is, do you believe? Do you believe he died on the cross for your sins and he was buried and resurrected for you? If you understand you're a sinner and you deserve to go to hell, yet Christ died for your debt of sin. He paid the price of your sin debt in full. He died for every one of your sins, even the ones you've not committed yet. You believe he did this for you? You trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and resurrected for you as your only hope to save you? You're born again. You receive the gift of eternal life. Forever a child of God. That is an amazing thing. You believe he did this for you and you trust in Jesus the Christ as your only hope to save you from a hell you deserve to a heaven you don't? 
you freely received the gift of eternal life, that is good news. If you've not trusted in Christ alone, my question is always, if you've not believed, what's stopping you right now? What are you holding on to? What do you got to lose? You have nothing to lose yet, everything to gain if you've not trusted in Christ alone. The thing of it is, if you turn over to your Bibles there, I didn't put it up there, I missed this, but my, the Bible, basically the verses I wanted to put up there were Psalms 94, 11. You can look that up. Psalms is the, if you open your Bible halfway through, it's Psalms opens up to the middle of the Bible. Psalms 94, 11 and Acts 1, 24. Here's the thing. You can fool me. You can fool your parents. You can fool your spouse. and You can fool your children. But the Lord knows what your heart is is trusting in. The Lord knows your intellect. Psalm 94, 11 says, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of men, that they are vanity. He knows our thoughts. He knows if you trusted in Christ alone or not. Acts 1, 24, it says this, And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men. And I ask people all the time, do you trust them? And they're like, after you surely, and say, I believe. I'm like, I, I hope you don't just say that for my benefit because that's not what it's about. I hope that you truly do trust in Christ alone as your Savior because God knows what you're trusting in. He knows if you believe it or not. It's right here. And if you do believe it, if you trust in Christ alone, you're born again, you're child of God forever. The Lord knows your thoughts. He knows what you're trusting in. He knows what you're believing in. He knows what you received. He knows what you're obeying. He knows what your faith is placed in, which all those terms basically mean the same. Trust, believe, receive, obey, faith, all the same. Yet I see men try to split hairs all the time and say belief is different than faith. No, because we know all these gospel messages are all the same. And it's this trust, believe, receive, because John 1, 12 through 13, actually John chapter 1, verse 12, is received. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you believe he died on the cross for your sins? Have you, Romans chapter 10 talks about obeying the gospel. Those are all the same. And if you're trusting in your good works, you need to know that you'll never make it. You'll never, ever go to heaven. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So if you're trusting in your church, in your ritual, in your sacrament or tradition to be saved, like water baptism, confirmation, confessional, or communion, one, you'll never find that in the Bible, but two, more important, you'll never get to heaven that way. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Somebody has to die for your sin. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Hebrews 9, 22. Man ignores those things. You know, that's what philosophy does. That's what tradition, that's what the rudiments of this world do. They want to say you can cover that up. And that's a lie. Somebody has to die for your sin. Christ did. Believe it, and his death payment has been put to your account. It's imputed to your account. Believe not, and you're still dead in your sins, just like it said in 1 Peter 2, 24. You're dead in your sins, spiritually dead. Dead in your sins, and you'll forever be dying in your sins because you cannot make a perfect sacrifice. That's why Christ came. If you could make a perfect sacrifice, Christ would have never came. That's what Galatians 2.20 says. But we can't. We're dead in our sins. And if we're dead, that means the kind of works that we offer are dead works. Remember Hebrews actually says, purge yourself from dead works? Yeah. So if we understand spiritually before we trust in Christ alone, we know exactly where we are. And we have to accept him as our Savior to be saved. So either you believe Christ, Jesus, died for your sins, all of them, was buried and resurrected for you. And ultimately his resurrection shows us that our sin debt is paid in full. And the very second we believe, we receive eternal life. See, if Christ's death doesn't give you eternal life the very second you believe, what does his death do for us? Nothing. The very second you believe he saves you from a hell, you deserve to a heaven, you don't. It has to give you eternal life the very second you believe, or it does nothing at all. The very second you believe you are translated from the kingdom of darkness, Colossians, we know that it says in Colossians 1.13, translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the sun, the kingdom of light. That's the power of the gospel. 
That's amazing. The very second you believe he saves you from hell, you deserve to heaven, you don't. This is why I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it's the power of salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the power of salvation. That's the good news. I can't hear that enough. I think that is absolutely amazing. I'm on the highway to hell. I'm going to hell. And the second I trust in Christ alone, it changes my eternal destiny forever. That's power. That's power. And every person that trusts in Christ alone for salvation, they believe his death for your debt of sin. When you believe that you're his death for your debt of sin, they immediately receive eternal life and can never lose it because Christ paid for all sin. Every person that trusts in Christ alone for salvation need to know they can never go to hell, can they're forever going to heaven. That's what John 3.16 says, shall never perish, but have eternal life. Once saved, always saved. Why? Because Christ paid for all sin. Every person that trusts in Christ alone for salvation need to know that it is not your faithfulness or your obedience that keeps you saved. We do not hold on to our salvation. We are sheep and sheep have hooves. It is Christ that holds on to us. It is God's promise that keeps us saved. We know that it says that in Hebrews and Romans. It's God's obedience that keeps us saved. It's God's faithfulness that keeps us saved in 1 Peter. It's God that holds on to us, and this is why we're forever sealed, forever saved. Forever sealed. Saved by God's grace. We're eternally secured by God's grace. So Christ has given you a free gift of eternal life. Do you accept it? Do you accept the gift or not? Do you believe in Christ alone or not? Again, God knows your heart. The Lord knows what you believe in for salvation. Again, you might be able to fool me, your spouse, but again, that doesn't matter. Where you're spending eternity is your choice. I pray, if you've not trusted in Christ alone, I pray that you receive him today, that you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your only hope for salvation. He died on the cross for all of your sins. He buried and resurrected for you. That's love. Nobody has done that for you. Nobody, there's no love like the love of God. And he, nobody gives you eternal life as a free gift. Only God can do that. If you have done, if you have done that, if you've done that last week, you've done it today, you've done it last year, you've done it 10 years ago, if you've done it 40 years ago, the very second you believed in Christ alone, you're born again, forever child of God. The person is just as saved the first day they accepted Christ Jesus. 50 years later, I'm no more saved or no less saved. I'm equally saved just like when I first trusted in Christ alone. So, now that we're born again, now you're a child of God, the question is, do you want to remain a babe in Christ like the Corinthians Do you want to remain a babe until you're called to glory? You can remain a babe if that's what you want. You can continue because we know that you have that old nature, new nature. You can remain a babe in Christ. You can feed that old nature, feed the lusts of the flesh, gain all the wealth of the world. However, what have you gained? What have you profited? You can't lose your salvation. The question is, what about your family? Your friends. You are saved. You can never lose your salvation. We know that every child of God has two natures. That sin nature, which is of the flesh. That's this part right here. The new nature has the new nature, which we know we're born again. That's what John 10, chapter 3 is all about. To Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. We all have a new nature. The ones that trust in Christ alone. It's a spirit nature. Born of God. That does not sin. Which one are you going to feed? That old nature or the new nature? Which one are you going to walk in? Are you going to walk in the lust of the flesh or are you going to walk in the spirit of life? That is your choice. Do you continue to live through the old nature, feed the flesh? Or do you learn how to yield yourself through the new nature? Learn how to yield yourself through the nature. That's what Romans 6 is all about. Yielding yourself to the new nature, allowing the Holy Spirit to work through your life to bear witness of the truth. John 15, the vine, the fruit we give bear, we bear witness to the truth. I do not produce the fruit, however, I bear witness to the truth, and the truth produces the fruit. That's what we're to do, to be lights in this dark world. And as a child of God, your testimony matters. Your testimony matters. 
It does not matter for your salvation, but it matters for others. And the question is, is your mom saved? Is your dad saved? Is your brother saved? Is your sisters saved? Are your grandchildren saved? How about your neighbor? Because all of that matters. We're to work out our salvation because we are children of God. We're no longer children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 2, the first part of it. This is no longer our home. Like Letty said, we are a family affair. We should not live as if this is our home. We should live and represent the one, capital O, that redeemed us as citizens and children of heaven because I am a citizen of heaven. This is no longer my home. I'm just a passing through. I cannot go to hell if I want to. I have peace with God. I have peace with death. I have peace knowing that I can't go to hell and forever going to heaven, not because of anything I've done, but because of what everything, what Christ has done for me. Why? Because Christ paid for all my sin. We know the wage of sin is death. His death has been put to my account. It is, this, it is, is as if I paid a perfect sacrifice for sin. Because I am identified in Christ. Since Jesus the Christ paid a perfect sacrifice for sin and later resurrected from the grave and lives eternally, this is why I live eternally. I've been resurrected in Christ. My Father in heaven no longer sees me as a guilty sinner, but sees me as a, as a son of God. So now that I am a purchased possession, now that I have been given this tremendous gift, now that I am a son of God, should I continue to live like I'm a child of this world? Or should I be convicted a little bit and be like, you know what, maybe I should live like a child of God. Again, you don't do it for your salvation. You already have that. The question is, that's a personal choice. And the older I get, the more conviction I have about that. And I would say this, God forbid that I would want to continue to live like a child of this world, like the lost live a life of the flesh. And why? Not because I answered to anybody else, because you know why? I want to represent my dad in heaven and my brother with a little bit of honor and integrity. I want my testimony to bear witness of his testimony. Because when people die, and we've had two people that we know this week die, and when people die, they, they either go to heaven forever or they go to hell forever. People go to hell every day. And it's forever. People go to hell with their sins paid for, but yet not put to their account because they have not received Christ as their Savior. That's tragic. That's why I believe the next verses are very important. These next verses tell us if we should live a life in the flesh or live a life as a son of God. Look at Colossians 2, 6, and 7. As I have therefore received Christ Jesus, already saved the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding with thanksgiving. So if a person has received, believed, trusted, obeyed the gospel of Christ, they are saved. Now that you're saved, forever saved, born again, born from above, born of a seed that's not rooted in corruption, as First Peter tells us. Now that you're saved and forever saved, you're rooted in Christ. Now that you're saved and forever saved, now is the time to grow up in Christ and be built up in him. Now that you're saved and forever saved, now is the time to establish your faith, be steadfast in your faith in Christ. And as you've been taught, so walk in him. Why should we walk in him? If you turn our Bible to 2 Corinthians 5, we'll look at 5.17 first, then 14.15, then 16.17 again. Why should we walk in him? Because one, I have a new identity. I have a new identity in Christ. Second Corinthians 5.17 tells me this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I'm a child of God. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's a beautiful verse. So as a child of God, I should not get caught up into those old things that I used to get caught up into. 
You know, I should ultimately, I have a new identity in Christ. My dad sees me as his son. Why should we walk in him? Your new motivation should be to love Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. It says, for the love of Christ constraineth me, which means motivates. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we, this judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Think about that. If Christ wouldn't have never came, we're all dead and we remain dead. Yet he revealed himself in the flesh and he died for all of us. And he gives us this free gift of eternal life. And you know what? We should ultimately understand that, grow in that, think about that. And that should motivate us. Because right there, which lives, we should, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him. That again, your choice. Why should you walk in him? Because you, you have a new perspective of others. Are they in Christ or are they not in Christ? Because if you act like the world with the lost, if you act like the lost with the lost, because you still have that old nature, you could still feel feed the lust of the flesh and still look, you know, just because you look saved or don't look saved doesn't mean you're saved. Again, the Lord knows what you trust in. We're not lordship salvation. We're not, you know, this, uh, you know, Calvinistic approach to that uh, churches around the world that are adopting today, that if you're saved, your life will look like it. No, they don't understand the two natures. We know that Romans, we know that Galatians 5 and Romans 7, we have the old nature, new nature, and that's the battle that Romans said, that Paul said in Romans 7, I do the things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I should do. That's the battle within us. But that's trying to live the Christian independent life. That's Romans 7. Then Romans 8 comes along and it's all about the Holy Spirit working through us. No longer do you read 25 times where it says I, I, I in Romans 7, but only one time you'll read in Romans 8 where it's I and the rest is about the Holy Spirit. So it's learning to yield through that new nature of the Holy Spirit reading, working through you through the Word of God, transforming your mind when Romans 12 comes along. But we have this new perspective are they in Christ or not? 1 Corinthians 15, 16 through 17 says, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, because it's positional truth, it's positional truth, either you are in Christ or not, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. So why should we walk in him? Because we have a new identity in Christ. Why should we walk in him? Because our motivation should be to love him. Why should we walk in him? Because the people that we're around, are they in Christ or not? Why should we walk in him? Turn over your Bible to Philippians chapter 2, 12 through 18. We read this last week, but I think it's worth reading this week again. Work out your salvation is in the context to the children of God. Speaking to believers in Philippians, another prison epistle that Paul wrote, Philippians chapter 2, 12 through 18. Why do we work out our salvation? Because it matters to the people around us. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Remember Philippians 1.27? That your conduct should become the gospel. That we, they sh you know, that basically our reputation precedes us. And ever when we go into the jail on Monday nights, the men know exactly what they're going to do. Our reputation precedes us. Our conduct becometh the gospel. That's what the Grace Gospel Church is all about. That we're saved by grace, live by grace. That's what we have, Philippians 1.27. And now this is a further explaining of working out your salvation, ultimately all your conduct becoming the gospel. For it is God which worketh in you. If you're not saved, you don't have God in you. But you are saved and you do have God in you. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Oh, I don't want to go to church today. I don't want to read the word of God today. No, no. 
Don't do things with murmurings or disputings. If God put it on your heart, then you know what? Pull out the word of God and read it. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, that in the eyes of men we could be blameless and harmless without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And we live in a crooked and perverse world today. And that's why we're to be lights in this dark world, among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's what Matthew 5 says. Holding forth the word of life. Holding forth the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if... I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. I joy and rejoice with you all for the same cause. Also, do you also joy and rejoice with me? So I say this, shine as lights in the world. How? Holding forth the word of life. And I ask a a rhetorical question here, probably. If you grew up and you found out that a certain man had left you an inheritance at 16 years old, somebody says, you know what, Lance? You are heir to this kingdom. This man wrote you some letters. Do you want to beat him? And I'll be like, wow, somebody left me an heir to the kingdom? And he wrote me letters. I probably would be motivated to read those letters. I probably would be. And I think that's exactly what the Word of God is. You're growing up in Christ. You know he's made us an heir to the kingdom. That's what it tells us. That during the millennial reign, we will be priests. We will serve with him as high priests and servants during that time. That's amazing. That will forever be in the presence of the Lord, forever. We sing about the, the, the river of life there. And I think often that me and my wife will be sitting on the banks of the river there where the silver spray comes up, coming from the throne of God there, dangling our feet in the river of life. I think that's pretty cool. But we has given us these letters. Our dad has written us letters. These letters are the word of God. These letters are letters from home. I think we should be motivated to read his word. So the question is, why should we read his letters? Why should we read his letters? You would think that being his children, we would want to know the will of our Father. you think that. And I've heard many people say, well, I don't understand the word or this and that. And I think it's just, you know, it's, if you got to read it 10 times, read it 10 times. I don't understand it all either. But you know, that doesn't stop me from reading. And I would say this, to know the will of the Father, we need to know the word of the Father. And I've heard men say before, if, you know, well, I pray, I pray all the time. And I'm thinking, and one of the men, I'm like, okay. I says, you know what, you're married, right, Rob? His name was Rob. He goes, yeah. And I says, okay. I said, let's say your wife does all the talking in the, in, the, in the relationship. I said, all she does is talk, talk, talk. And I said, you have something to say, but you don't ever get a chance to say anything. I said, how does that make you feel, Rob? He <laughs> goes, that would be frustrating. I go, oh. I said, so if you do all the talking and yet you don't do any listening, I said, how do you think that makes your dad feel? And he goes, oh, light bulb comes on. He goes, I understand why we should read. Yeah, it's good to pray, but you know what? We need to read. We need to read. Because you know what? If you ever want to know the will of the Father, you got to know the word of the Father. If you're going to walk in Christ, we need to read the will of the Father. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, we need to read the will of the Father. If we are not going to fill the lusts of the flesh, if you're not going to walk in that old nature, we need to read the will of the Father. I think the most important thing a child of God can do is read the letters from home. Read the Word of God. The question is, I ask this, do you love God? Does the gospel of Christ motivate you to share the gospel, the God's love with others? Because it is not our love towards God that saves us. No, remember, He loved us before we loved Him. 
It is his love that saves us from a hell we deserve to have and we don't. And I would say this, there are many people going to heaven that have trusted in the gospel that probably don't love them. Just like that baby with Kaylee, Paxton. When that baby was born, you know what, Zach and Kaylee had a baby, that baby when born did not know how to love. It's a baby. That baby doesn't know how to love. It still does not know how to love. It's six months old. However, over time, ultimately by mom and dad's love, their kindness, their patience, care, compassion, that child will understand and grow up one day to love the parents back. And I believe that's the same for us. When you're a babe in Christ, you get saved. Do you really understand? No, but you're saved. I mean, but do you, do you have a love for God? I think it's got to grow, just like that baby's got to grow. And understand, you're a baby. So now that we're born again, we need to be nourished on the milk of the word, the water of life, the bread of life, and ultimately the meat of the word, so we can understand what Christ truly has done for us, and that we can be motivated. We can be motivated to love him back. And I'll reread 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. For the love of Christ, think about that, for the love of Christ motivates us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we were all dead. I was dead. And that he died for all. It's amazing. All and they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So being born again, understand that you have been saved from a hell that you deserve to a heaven you don't. By the power of the gospel, knowing that you have a new eternal destination by Christ, knowing that you're born again, you have a new nature, knowing that you have God living within you. Does that motivate you? That's, an, that's a question that only you can answer. I think it should. It should motivate us to read our letters from home so we can walk in him, we can shine as lights in this world by holding forth the word of life. Reading the word of God and then him teaching us how to walk in Christ because Christ will give you in every example, every scenario, how to be a better dad, how to be a better wife, how to be a better spouse, how to be a better employee, how to be a better boss. He gives us examples of all that. Read the Word of God and He'll teach you how to walk in Christ. Let us read the Word of God. So my challenge, if you open your Bible to the middle of the Bible, open up, should open up right around the Psalms. If you open up the Psalms, we know the center of the Bible. So turn over to these chapters right now. Let's look at Psalms 117, 118. So you got Psalm 118. It's the center of the Bible. It's interesting what Psalm 118 is. It says there, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good because his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. And let them now fear the Lord. And this is his mercy endureth forever. This is the, this is the center of the Bible. That his mercy endures forever. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me. He hears our prayers. He set me in a large place. And the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? What can man do unto me? It cannot take my salvation. He might be able to kill me. But he will never take my eternal destination. The Lord taketh my part with those who help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. That's the middle of the Bible. The verse, the chapter before it, it's the shortest verse, the shortest chapter in the Bible. So Psalm 118 is the middle of the Bible. Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter, two verses. Oh, praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people. For he is merciful, kindness is great toward us. The truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise ye the Lord. The longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. You know what it's about? It's about the Word of God. So my challenge to you is that you would read Psalm 119 this week. It's 176 verses, but all speaks to the Word of God 
and what the Word of God does in our lives. So I've gleaned 119, and I want to highlight a few verses. So if you look at Psalm 119, and look at verse 9. So as you study the Word of God this week, I would challenge you again to read Psalm 119, and if you get done with Psalm 119, read 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because you know what 2 Timothy chapter 2 says? Be strong, stay strong in the all-sufficient grace that's in Jesus Christ. Because that's what it's all about. It's about the grace in Christ. And then it goes on about being a soldier, being a farmer, and then all these things. That we would not get caught, get caught up and uh, entangle ourselves with the things of the world. That we would be vessels that would be used for holiness, ultimately to share the gospel. Amazing stuff. So read Psalm 119, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Anyways, it says here in Psalm 119.9, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. When I read Psalm 119.9, I'm thinking, you know, cleanse. It made me think of John chapter 13, when Jesus met with the apostles in the upper room discourse. He says, Jesus grabs his robe and wraps it around him, and he gets on his knees there, and he starts washing the apostles' feet. And you know what? The, he, Peter's like, oh, not me. And Jesus says, yeah, you, we know that you're already cleansed whole. You don't need to be cleansed again because you were washed by the blood of the Lamb. But you know what? As you walk in this dark world, as you walk in this world, your feet are going to get a little dirty. And you need a feet cleaning every day. Your feet need to be washed. And how are you wash your feet? You wash it by the word of God. And that's what we're talking about. When Christ washed the feet of the disciples in John 13, we know that we're cleansed from our sin by the blood of Christ. However, we need our feet washed daily. As we walk in this world, our feet get dirty. As I go to work and be around lost people, I get a little bit dirty. I need to come home and wash. It is through the word of God that we get this daily cleansing. That's what it tells us. Look at Psalm 119.11. Thy word have I hidden in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Again, when we sin, I might hurt my wife. I might hurt my daughter-in-law. I might hurt my granddaughter. I might hurt my son. I might hurt my friends. I might hurt the people of the church here, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Those are people that I might hurt. I might hurt my kids. But you know what? When I sin, it is against God. It is against God. I might hurt my friends, but the fact is when I sin, it's against God. We know that in Psalm 51.4. Yes, all my sins paid for. However, do I want to continue to contribute to him dying? I know he already paid for my sins tomorrow. But you know, should I continue to contribute to what he did? And as I grow by the word, he's been like, no, I don't want to continue to contribute to put him on the cross. God forbid, as Romans 6 says, I do not want to take advantage of his grace. And how do I do this? It tells us this is why we need to read the word of God, is that I'm to hide the word of God in my heart. Hide the word of God in your heart because it is the word of God that helps us not sin against God. That's why I read it. I've heard people say, well, you know what? I don't sin anymore. I don't lie anymore. That's not what, that's not what it says here. It doesn't say don't to stop doing all these things because you know what, we're, that's called asceticism and we're going to see that in Colossians 2 that we not get caught up in asceticism that we don't do all, the, not going to do this, not going to that's not, that's not stop sinning how do you stop sinning? how do you sin not against God? reading his word, having his word of God meditating on his word because when people say I don't lie anymore who gets the glory? think about it when people say I don't lie anymore you know what gets the glory? It's you. That's pride. And that's sin. If you truly do not want to sin against our father and brother, read the word of God. Hold the word of God close to your heart. That will help you sin not against our father and our brother. Remember, you will sin until you die because you have a flesh nature. It is only when you physically die that we know that you're freed from the presence of sin in your life and ultimately called to glory. We know that all sin, James tells us, that all sin is conceived in the mind. It starts right here. Praying the Lord, search us out. That's what Psalm 139. If you look at Psalm 139, it says that we would pray to God that he search us out. Why? We know why he does this. That he'd reveal what sin you're thinking about. Because we all 
It'll pop in our minds, that he would search us out, that he would reveal it to us what we're thinking about, and that we would learn to yield through the power of the Holy Spirit to have Christian victory in our life. Instead of meditating on the sin in my life, that I would meditate on the Word of God, that I could, instantly God could reveal to me, okay, and I can change my mind. Think about some verses that will help me get through that scenario. This is just in two verses that we get this. Look at Psalm 1, 19, 14. I've rejoiced in the way of thy testimony as much as in all riches. I put rejoiced in the way. Rejoice in thy testimonies, the riches of Christ. Psalm 119, 15. I will meditate in thy precepts, which we know precepts is the written word of God. I have respect unto thy ways. Meditate on thy precepts, which is written in the word of God. That we would read it and meditate, think about it. Look at Psalm 119, 16. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. It's important that we read it and not forget it, that we would meditate it, remember those promises. Walking in Christ is reading the word of God. Look at Psalm 119, 27. Make me to understand thy way of thy precepts, of thy written word. So, I, so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. Help me understand so I can share the gospel of Christ. Help me understand the written word of God so I can declare the wonderful works with others. Psalm 119, verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. I shall deserve, observe it with my whole heart. Make me unto the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimony, and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eye from beholding vanity, and revive thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach which I fear, but thine ordinances are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Give me life in thy righteousness. And I, what, I, what I got out of that, I says, teach me the word of God, that we would read it and that we, he would teach us it, that he would give me understanding of the word of God, that he would help me be, not be covetous this, that I would not want, you know, the next big house down the road. I would not not the next F-250 that's coming out. That would not get caught up into this vanity of this world because that's what commercials are all about. It is the eyes of the flesh. They just show all these things and we get caught up and it's all about this and that. And ultimately, we're always trying to get the next big thing. It's all about the vanity and pride of life. Revive me through the word. Remind me what's important. Establish the word within me. That I could be a light in this dark world. Establish the word within me. Plant the word of God within me. Let it grow up in me. Let the word of God grow within me. Look at Psalm 119, 49 through 50. Remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction for thy word hath given me life. Remember the word of God. The word of God gives us hope. In a world that we can walk around, we get surrounded by distress. Brian has said it before, you know, be anxious for nothing. We know Philippians 4 says, be anxious for nothing. Because when we look at the, the temporary things of this world, it gets pretty, and we focus on those temporary things, it can look a little hopeless and helpless at times. But we know the Word of God gives us hope. The Word of God gives us comfort. For He's given us the comfort within us. And we know the Word of God has given me life. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. And that ultimately that I could live by faith every single day and not by the physical situations of this world. Psalms 119, 105. Look what that says. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Why should you walk in Christ? Why should we read the word of God? Because the word of God is a lamp. It's a lamp unto our feet. The word of God is a light unto our path. And when you walk in Christ, God has a path for you. And it is through the word of God that you can see this path. Look at Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. The word of God gives light. 
when the gospel of Christ is shared to the lost who are in darkness. Just like when ultimately Saul on the road to Damascus, he says, I seen the light. That's what happens to the lost. They see the light. The word of God gives understanding. Psalm 119, 140 through 42. Thy word is very pure. Therefore thy servant loveth it. I am small and despised, yet do not I forget thy precepts. Thy righteousness is everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. The word of God is pure. The word of God is holy. The word of God is used for correction, for building up, and exhorting. The righteousness that God gives us is everlasting. The word of God is truth. Truth does not change. So why should you walk in Christ? Why should we read the word of God? Because it's pure, it's holy, and it's true. And I say this, everything else is a lie. Why fill your minds with lies and deception? We should only want to fill our minds with truth, with purity and holiness, which is the word of God. So why should you walk in Christ? Why should you read the Word of God? We should not only read the Word of God, we should immerse ourselves in it. That's what the Bible tells us in 119, Psalm 119, verses 147 through 48. It says, I am anticipated the dawning of the morning, and I cried, I hoped in thy word. Mine eyes anticipate the night watches that I might meditate in thy word that we would read the Word of God day and night, that we would meditate about it, and that we would maybe even dream about it. That's where our eyes should be focused on, in the morning and in the evening, that we're dawning on it, our hope is in it, and at the end of the day, we continue to meditate on it and think about it and read it. Look at Psalm 119.50. Look at this. They draw near that follow after mischief. They are far from thy law. But you know what? 151 says, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. See, the enemy draws near unto us. We know that Satan, the demons, they roam around like a roaring lion out to see who they can intimidate and fear. But you know what? They can't take our salvation. But you know, the enemy can sure destroy our testimony. Can destroy our testimony. But you know who's near? It's God. Tells us that in 151. God is near. The enemy's near, but you know who's near? God. It is through the word of God that we can face daily challenges because it is God who is with us. He guides us. He cleanses us. He gives us hope and comfort through the word of God. It is through the word of God that revives us. So I believe this. I believe walking in Christ, as it says there in Colossians 2.6, I believe walking in Christ is reading the Word of God and hiding the Word of God in your heart so you sin not against Him. I believe walking in Christ is reading the Word of God so we can be rooted in Him, built up in Him, established in the faith, and ultimately and be a cedar and be an oak that's planted alongside the river of life. And not a reed as a water that when the current changes by the philosophy of men that we would then follow that. No. I believe walking in Christ is reading the word of God and that we do not the following, which is Colossians 2.8, which we know said this. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Bless you. I believe walking in Christ is reading the word of God and having an attitude of gratitude and always giving thanks for Christ, for salvation, for eternal life, 
for redemption, for saved from a hell that we deserved, forever having eternal life. Thankful for the written word of God. Thankful for all of creation that reveals the power of Christ. Thankful for the revelation of Christ. Thankful for my wife and my mom and dad and kids and my friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. Thankful for their salvation. And ultimately, hopefully, my grandkids' salvation. Thankful that I have a written word of God, oh, my own copy, because we know in 51 countries, there's 198 countries in the world, in 51 countries, it's illegal to own a Bible. It's illegal to be a Christian, and we're going to see more of that. I'm thankful that I have a letters from home. I'm thankful that he's given us a building to proclaim the word of God. When most churches are closing, that one in five are closing, that we're opening and we're growing. All by God's grace. I'm thankful that we can pray to him daily. And I'm thankful that he hears my prayers. I'm thankful that he has answered my prayers. And I'm thankful that he has not answered some of my prayers. I'm thankful, ultimately, that I know the one and true God. Jehovah God. The ever-present Jesus Christ. The Son of God. That's why I'm thankful. That's why I'm so grateful. These letters from home are eternal. These letters from home are the words of the Lord and they never change. Let me read two verses and then we'll close. Psalm 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. This word of God does not change. There is a Bible in heaven. This word is in heaven. Psalm 119.89. 1 Peter 1.23-25 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. It is the word of God. It's the power of salvation to everyone that believes is by the word of God, which liveth and abide forever. For all flesh are as grass, and all the glory of men flower of glass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof faileth away. But the word of the Lord and endures forever and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you let us read the letters from home let us learn how to walk in Christ having a light shine under our feet guiding us in a path in life let this hand represent you and I this wallet who represents our sin actually says sin right on there for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Matter of fact, Isaiah 59 tells us sin keeps us a barrier between God and man. Now man will try to tell you, you can just cover that sin up. Just do good works, dedicate your life, turn your life around, make a promise, this and that. But we know what we know the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let this hand here represent Jesus Christ. We know that ultimately in Genesis 22, Abraham, Jacob said, you know what, where is the lamb? And Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. And 2,000 years later, we know that ultimately, you know, John the Baptist was on the banks of the Jordan River, and he says, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, John 1, And we know that Jesus Christ went to the cross, and he shed his blood, and he died, and he resurrected the third day, showing his pain for sin is paid in full. And if you would believe that, his death, burial, and resurrection has been put to your account. I would hope that all of you believe that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we just want to thank you for Christ. Thankful for the amazing gift of eternal life, freely given when we trust in Christ alone. We believe that he died on the cross for his sins, was buried, resurrected. And Father, maybe online, maybe here today, somebody for the first time has trusted in Christ alone. They heard the gospel of salvation. They were born again by the word of God. Born of a new seed that's incorruptible because they believed what you did for them. That's the good news. And Father, to your children, we just pray that they would read the word, they would grow up in Christ, and that they would hold forth the word of life, and that they would allow the word to be a lamp under their feet. That's between them and you. Father, we just pray that you'd they'd read your word through the week and they'd grow up in Christ. Father, we just pray you keep everybody safe and secure. You know the needs of the people. We pray for them every day. We pray that your will would be done. We pray that you'd bring us all back next week. We continue to give glory to you. We pray all in Christ's name. Amen. We'll sing our last song.
All right, if you'd stand and open up your songbooks, song number 17, Nothing But Blood. Yeah. Yeah. 